Luke 1, 67 through 80. And his father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. As he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham, to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people, in the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance to Israel. Awesome. Thank you, Lucy. Give it up for Lucy, ripping students. <laughs> students, students, students. Y'all can have a seat. Let it be known on the podcast, the whole room was chanting with me. Students. No. Uh, Guys, we're continuing in Luke today. Uh, I literally didn't have my mic on until that last song. I was like, oh, I need my mic. Uh, We're continuing in Luke. We're finishing chapter one today. Uh, We started like eight weeks ago or something. We got to the the end of chapter one here. I'm titling this sermon, Good on Your Promise, if you want to write that down. Uh, And hopefully at the end of the sermon, that makes sense. If not, just come ask me some questions. Uh, But last week we ended with uh, a question in the text. It was the birth of John the Baptist. There was a question posed uh, at his birth. What then will this child be? And we get the answer. We just heard the answer. Lucy read it for us. uh, And we get so much more. Zechariah sings a song in this moment. Uh, of his son's birth. It's a prophetic song. It's full of prophecy, full of uh, a lot of theology from the Old Testament. We're going to look at it all today, dig through it, and uh, hopefully see why I titled this Good on Your Promise. Uh, So first, I I, want to dig into everything he says, everything that we just heard read for us, uh, but I just want to make a few notes, give a little bit of context uh, why uh, I think this, this song is So beautiful, so powerful, so impactful. Uh, Hopefully this context helps us a little bit. But first first thing is a a prophecy, really quickly, just so we're all on the same page. A prophecy is a word directly from the Lord to his people. Uh, 99% of the time it's through a prophet. Uh, A prophet is a person who speaks on behalf of the Lord. So in this moment, Zechariah becomes a prophet as he's singing this song. The Spirit fills him. Uh, And the Old Testament is full of prophets all over the place. Uh, Moses, Abraham, Daniel, Elijah, all of like the second half of the Old Testament, the books are major and minor prophets. It's just, that's like the main way God was speaking to his people in the Old Testament, through prophets. He would speak to his people through somebody, give them a word, they would declare it. Uh, A lot of it was like calling Israel into repentance, but a lot of it was looking to the future of the Messiah and, and this one that was going to come and fulfill all these promises God was making to his people. So it's full of prophecy, the Old Testament. And then, and this is the contextual part I want us to hear, uh, there's 400 years of silence. And I I think we've already been over this a little bit. I'm just giving a little recap. Uh, 400 years of silence, which is a really long time. 1623, uh, that's 400 years ago. We weren't even a country yet. Like we weren't Right? Yeah, we weren't even a country yet. 1776? <laughs> Not even a country yet. I actually Googled 1623, what happened in 1623? And, like, nothing came up. So I said, what happened in the 1600s? And the first three things that popped up were uh, William Shakespeare, so I guess he was still alive, witch hunts, and moon maps. I, they were hunting witches. They were mapping the moon. I don't know. But 1600s is a long time ago. We weren't even a country. 400 years of silence from the Lord. Uh, And that doesn't mean he wasn't active or moving in his people. Obviously, he was. He's always at work. Uh, But it just means he wasn't, like, revealing anything new through prophecy. He wasn't having anything written down. It was 400 years uh, of silence. And the people 
of, of God were so used to, you know, hearing prophecies, but when he was silent, all they had to do, all they had was to cling to his promises. Uh, the, the Old Testament uh, heroes of the faith, they, they had to just take God at his word and just believe his promises, cling to his promises. So then you get to 400 years of silence, and it's like, okay, well, here's what God said, let's cling to that. And so Zechariah is one of those people, he was a priest, he was clinging to the promises of God his whole life, and uh, probably praying like, Lord, when will these promises come to fulfillment? Uh, so then he goes, quick recap, he goes to the temple, uh, like we, we heard a few weeks ago, he goes to the temple, his day has come, he's, he's chosen by lot to go in, this is a once in a lifetime honor, uh, you don't do this more than once if you're a priest, there's so many priests that you go in to the temple one time. So this is his day, and he goes in, Gabriel shows up, he says, you're going to have a son. Zechariah's probably like, do you talk to everybody in here? Like, is this normal? Uh, but the, the, the main thing that happens in this moment, Gabriel showing up to Zechariah, is that the silence of 400 years is broken. God speaks, the, the, the prophetic silence is broken directly to uh, Zechariah. He says, you're going to have a son. It's the return of Elijah. And uh, old Zachy boy doubts. He doesn't believe it. He, uh, which, I mean, I, like, I don't blame him. I'm sure it's, like, really disarming seeing a, uh, an angel in front of you on the, the day that you get to go into the temple. Uh, there's probably a lot of emotions. But he just doesn't believe it, if, which is okay. Like, if I was struck mute for nine months every time I doubted, I wouldn't talk my entire life, which is pretty much already happening. I just don't, I don't speak. You can ask Becca. I don't like to talk. I don't know what I'm doing up here. Uh, but Sean dug into this, those nine months of silence. He was struck mute. Silent. Those nine months uh, were probably a time full of repentance. Sean taught us last week, full of repentance of that moment of like, ah, the Lord broke his silence to me. And he told me something, and I, I didn't believe him. I was like, can you give me a sign? Even though Gabriel is a massive sign that the Lord is speaking to you. And he doubted. He didn't believe it. And those nine months are, are probably full of repentance, but also probably full of just like dwelling on the Old Testament promises that Zechariah was so acquainted with. He just knew them. He was probably just combing through those promises that the Lord had, had said to his people that he had studied his whole life, just thinking like, okay, this is starting to make sense. I, these promises are about to come to pass. Gabriel just showed up and told me, that my son is going to be the return of Elijah. That's wild. That signals the day of the Lord is at hand. We'll, we'll get to that in a minute. He's probably just realizing, okay, big things are happening right here. This is a move of the Lord. And uh, I'm mute. I can't even talk about it. I can't even tell the people uh, what he told me. One quick note, I thought this was awesome. He's probably sitting there mute, and he sees Elizabeth and Mary interacting, and Elizabeth is filled with the Spirit and prophesies. So she gets to prophesy before Zechariah does, which is just, like, really cool, I think. And he's probably like, is this on? Oh, he's probably like, that was my moment. Like, I, I shouldn't have doubted, because if he hadn't doubted and been struck mute, I'm pretty sure he would have walked out of the temple and been like, okay, Gabriel showed up in there, and I've got a word. Silence is broken. Elizabeth gets to prophesy before Zechariah. Women are pretty important and awesome. I love it. Uh, so he finally, God finally speaks. Zechariah's like, he spoke to me. I can't even, I can't even say what is happening. I'm, I'm seeing it all happening. I'm watching my wife interact with her cousin, who's the mother of my Lord. And he, he just can't talk. But finally, on the day of his birth, of, uh, of, of John's birth, he, he says, his name is John. He writes it down. Uh, and the feelings that he is probably feeling in that moment. I bawled my eyes out when Dean was born. And as far as I know, he's not a major biblical figure. Uh, I, I was not told he was. He's really into lights. That's about it. That's, uh, he'll be turning these on and off after service. Zechariah gets an answered prayer for a child. So the day of this child's birth is probably such an overwhelming moment, just like it is for you know, all fathers who have had a kid. It's like, oh, this is an overwhelming moment. But it's also for Zechariah the fulfillment of the oldest promises in the Old Testament happening right here. So let me read this quote from a, a commentary I read. It says, at this period of the world, we can hardly understand the depth of this good man's feelings. 
we must imagine ourselves in his position. We must fancy ourselves seeing and beholding the accomplishment of the promise brought near to our own door of a savior. We must try to realize what a dim and imperfect view men had of the gospel before Christ actually appeared and the shadows and types passed away. Then perhaps we may know some idea of the feelings of Zechariah when he cries out, blessed be the Lord. So this is a huge moment. This is a huge day for him because uh, he's having a son in his old age, which is amazing. And he's also realizing God is on the move and some big things are happening. So he's firm in his belief. He's full of faith. He writes down his name is John and the Lord looses his tongue. He uh, takes away his, his muteness and uh, he says, all right, You've been sitting on this for nine months, buddy. It's time, to, it's time to tell him what's up. Tell him what I'm doing. And so the Holy Spirit fills Zechariah. So that's where we're at. That's the context. And the Holy Spirit fills Zechariah. And he becomes a prophet for a moment. And he sings out this song of blessing and of prophecy. And uh, we're going to dig into it. Before we do that, real quick, this is just a little treat. That very first line of the text, Toby, you can put it up there. It, uh, it says that he was filled with the Spirit. I already said that, but... That's the very first line I don't want to skip over. Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit. This dude doubted Gabriel, an angel, a very real angel, right in front of him. Just said, I don't believe you. And uh, then he was struck mute for nine months. And then the Lord fills him with his spirit. So just a little treat for you before we get to the, the full meal here. Your sin doesn't define you. I just thought this was cool. Your sin does not define you. It doesn't make you unusable uh, by God. One sin, a thousand sins, new, old. God is in the business of restoring you to himself and using you for his purposes. So Zechariah doubted an angel, and God fills him with his spirit nine months later and says, all right, tell the people what I'm doing. So quick note, your sin doesn't make you unusable. Uh, and maybe somebody needs to hear that. Uh, all right, let's look at this song. It's a beautiful song, Zach's song, Zechariah's song. Uh, the timing of this truly was just the Lord. I was just given a date, and then they split up the, the text, and it happens to be Zechariah's song. I love it. All right, Zechariah sings out. He says, blessed be the Lord God of Israel. He sings this praise to the Lord. He spills over with, with praise, and this worship is happening because he's seeing the, the fulfillment, the covenant fulfillment about to happen, God keeping his word keeping his promises, and so he starts singing praise, like, Lord, you're good on your word. And this song is packed full of scripture that we're about to dig into. Scholars think 33 possible allusions in this uh, short song to the Old Testament. Allusions, quotes, 33 different things that you could pull out of the Old Testament in this song. That's packed full of theology. Uh, so Zechariah spills over with script scripture, uh, he sings this song, which, by the way, isn't that beautiful just to, like, be around people who obviously sit in the Word of God and they just spill over with Scripture. I think we've all been around people like that. Little application, be more like that. I'm trying. Y'all are trying. I know it. Uh, but he spills over with Scripture because he, he just sat in it his whole life. He, he studied it, and uh, this song has a ton. So let's look at it. Verse 67, blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. And he's raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. So we're going to stop there. This is the first thing that uh, Zechariah sings about. It is the, the fulfillment of of the Davidic covenant. He sings praise for the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. Quickly, you can note, uh, this is in the past tense. I was a little confused about that, so I had to look it up. He says, you have visited and have redeemed. And I was like, well, Jesus isn't born yet. Uh, what does he mean? I learned it's just prophetic past tense. And that's a thing, prophetic past tense. Uh, it means that it's as good as done. He's prophesying, and it's as good as done. Uh, it's like if I'm going to the grocery store, and Becca says, hey, can you get eggs? And I say, done. It's not actually done, but it's going to be done, unless I forget. And then, <laughs> then I'll go back, and I'll get them. Uh, 
So it's as good as done. That's why it's in the past tense right there. But this is the Davidic covenant, covenant that he's talking about, the fulfillment the, of God's promise to David, which is simply that David was going to have a son, Solomon, and Solomon would be his successor, and Solomon would build the temple that David wanted to build. And then even greater than that, there would be somebody in the line of David that would establish a throne forever. Uh, that was God's promise to David. And Zechariah is saying, oh, this is the fulfillment of that. Real quick, we'll read it. Second Samuel 7. This should be up on the screen. This is the Lord promising that to David. The Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I'll establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. So this is God's promise to David. And uh, the people of God clung to this promise. That really hyped them up that there was going to be a king whose kingdom would be forever. That was like an awesome promise to them because who doesn't want that, first of all? And after you've been a people afflicted for so long and walking in deep darkness, it sounds really great to have a king whose kingdom is going to be forever. Uh, and so they clung to this promise. They clung to it. Uh, they remembered it. They thought about it. Zechariah clung to this. Uh, so he, he sings, okay, this is the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. I'm seeing it right here. He calls Jesus the horn of salvation. Uh, in that second verse, he, he raised up a horn of salvation for us. A horn of salvation, that's a name for our God that you've probably heard. It's symbolic of strength, uh, most often associated with the horn of ox, oxen, or buffalo. Uh, if you've ever seen those animals, they're huge, and their, their horns are strong and dangerous. Uh, I saw a, a, a video on the Weather Channel app. They got videos on there. Uh, I was checking the, checking the weather, and they had a video that I said I'll watch. Uh, it was people in Yellowstone doing dumb things. That seems to happen a lot. Uh, yesterday, there was a video of a, a girl stick, sticking her foot in a hot spring and was like, this is hot. And people were like, yeah, it's a hot spring. But one month ago, I saw this video. It was a uh, buffalo next to a sidewalk grazing, and people on that sidewalk getting close to it. And one girl was like, I want to take a picture with the buffalo. Maybe y'all saw this. But she, she just sticks her hand out near the buffalo. Like, it's like right there. And she's like, but not touching it. So I don't know the point of the hand. She could have just like, but the buffalo who is grazing just like uses 2% of its energy to just like, can you leave me alone? Like just kind of nudges his head towards her. He's like, please go away. And this girl does like the biggest NBA flop. She's just like, don't. <laughs> and the buffalo didn't touch her. You can go watch it. But he's just like, please leave me alone. And she's, oh, and the camera's like, no. And uh, people are like, are you okay? Are you okay? And I, and just embarrassed for her. The buffalo, had he used like 20% of his strength, would just like have knocked that girl out. 100% uh, of his strength, she, she would no longer exist. Uh, these animals are strong. Oxen are strong. And uh, Zechariah describes Jesus as the horn of salvation raised up for us because when he stands up in strength, like a buffalo would or an oxen would, it is a... Uh, a terrifying and awesome thing. Um, he is uh, the king that the, the Lord has raised up for us in the strength of our Lord. He's a mighty savior and he's bringing deliverance to us. This is our horn of salvation. And Hebrews 7 tells us he's able to save us to the uttermost. He's able to save us to the uttermost. When the horn of salvation reaches down for you and you take hold of him, he pulls you from the deepest pit and sets you in the highest places and that is to the uttermost. And when you're in the highest places, there is nothing that can pull you out of that. There's no pit too deep he can't pull you up from. Uh, you are saved to the uttermost. Um, and that's a promise. It's a good promise. Uh, and this, this horn of salvation, he came as a baby in Mary's womb, which is just like so beautiful and paradoxical. It's just wild. I love it. Zachariah is probably seeing it and just blown away. So he's a horn of salvation. He's the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. 
Uh, that's the first thing to note in here. The second thing, verse 72, we'll read it. To show mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham, to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. So, second thing to note uh, is the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant. Two covenants being fulfilled here, big ones. Uh, the Abrahamic covenant comes before the Davidic covenant. Really, the Davidic covenant just rests on the promise already made to Abraham. Uh, God promises Abraham while he's still childless that he's going to make a great nation out of him and that all the people of the earth will be blessed through him. Uh, and Abraham's like, okay, I don't have a son, but I believe you, which is kind of cool. Juxtaposed to Zechariah, who did not believe Gabriel. Abraham says, I believe you, God. And God is so pleased with his faith in that moment, and we're about to read this, but he's so pleased in his faith that he has him cut three animals in half. Uh, this is how they made covenants in the Old Testament. If you and a, a buddy wanted to make a covenant, you have to cut an animal in half and you each walk through the middle of it and you say, all right, if either of us break our promise, let us become like these animals. Do to us what we just did to this animal. Uh, it is pretty serious. We just don't do that anymore. We shake hands and uh, that's about it. Sometimes spit in your hand, shake it. This is how we make covenants. They made covenants in a very serious way. They took it for real. Uh, Genesis 15, 17, God had, God had Abraham split up three animals. And then Genesis 15, 17, it says, The sun had gone down, and it was dark, and behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between those pieces. Whew. Super cool. I didn't know why it was cool until I studied this. So I'm just telling you guys what I learned. But this was a cool verse uh, that I've been sitting in for the past two weeks. This is a moment where God... There's a theophany, God reveals himself in a physical manifestation, and he passes through pieces, meaning I'm making a covenant with you, Abraham, right here. And he doesn't make Abraham walk through it. He says, this is a one-sided covenant right now. I, God, am walking through these animals, and if I don't keep my word that I just gave you, let me be torn asunder like these animals. Let me be split in half. Let me become not God, because you can't split God in half. So he's like, I will lay down my deity if I don't become this. I'm keeping my word to you. This is a covenant I'm making to you. He, he, he makes this covenant and he swears on himself, uh, which has never happened again. Uh, this is the one time, Abrahamic covenant. God swears on himself. Abraham says, on God. And God says, on God, for real. I'm sorry, I had to. He, uh, but he says, I, I have nothing to swear higher than myself. Uh, on what would I swear other than me? He's, he's the highest. And so he says, on me, I swear that I will keep my word to you, Abraham. Genesis 22, 16 through 18, it'll be on the screen as well. Uh, this is just a few chapters later, Isaac has been born. Abraham is walking with him and the Lord says, go sacrifice Isaac on that mountain. Abraham does it. He, he's like, okay, God, I believe you. And Abraham's belief just puts us to shame. I imagine that Abraham was so sure of God's word of making a people out of him, out of his offspring, that he's just saying, okay, Lord, like, if you're going to make me sacrifice my son, you're probably going to bring him back to life, or you're going to have a miracle happen, or whatever. He's just so full of faith, so confident in God that he walks in obedience up this mountain. We know the story. God stops him. Praise the Lord. He gives him a, a sacrificial uh, ram and a... Uh, on that mountain, he reiterates his covenant to Abraham. So this is Genesis 22. By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. That's cool. And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. Jesus is that offspring that uh, Zechariah is calling out. He's seeing it. He's calling it out. He's the offspring that all the nations are blessed through. We follow him in his, his footsteps. Uh, he's the one that will lead us into the promised land. 
he is Christ in us. Um, and I think it's cool to note that on the same mountain, Mount Moriah, that Isaac was supposed to be sacrificed on 2,000 years later, now called Calvary, our horn of salvation, our sacrificial lamb, willingly lays down his life for us to secure that promise that, that God made to Abraham. Same mountain. I didn't know that. It was cool. Cool facts. Uh, so through Jesus, the rest of what Zechariah says, we are set free. We are delivered from the hand of our enemies that we might serve without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. So the Abrahamic covenant is fulfilled. Zechariah sees it. He's like, this is happening. The covenant to Abraham, the covenant to David, they're about to, to come to pass. He's calling it out. Uh, the third thing that he, he says, we finally get to his son. He kind of just bypassed John for a second uh, and says, I I'll get to you, but I got to say some things really quick about Jesus. And he, he calls these things out. And then he says, all right, Johnny, 76, you child will be called the prophet of the most high. For you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways. So that's the answer to the question that we heard last week. Uh, you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways. He's the prophet of the most high. That's what John the Baptist is. And the Holy Spirit reveals through Zechariah uh, that this is the return of Elijah, which is the last prophecy that we heard in the Old Testament. Malachi 4, uh, 5 through 6, it's the last prophecy given before that 400 years of silence. Uh, and it says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. So that's the last thing uh, that was prophetically said in the Old Testament. And Zechariah was probably very knowledgeable of that prophecy and realizes, oh, my son is the return of Elijah? People have been waiting for Elijah. The, the Jewish people are still waiting for the return of Elijah. Uh, if, you, if you see them celebrating Passover, there's often a chair empty at the table of celebration because they are saying, Elijah's coming back, that's his chair. And they're waiting for that because that will signal the day of the Lord. Uh, but in this moment, Zechariah, so proud, gets to say, bless the Lord, the Messiah is coming, the, the covenant of Abraham is fulfilled, the covenant of David is fulfilled, and my son gets to fulfill the last prophecy that we heard in Malachi. He is the return of Elijah. Elijah. He's the return of the prophet Elijah, which signals the day of the Lord. You're Elijah John, don't you know? That was just for, that was just for Becca. I keep putting jokes in here. I'm so sorry. Uh, it's from a show we watch. Uh, I shouldn't do this. Um, Elijah is the prophet of the Most High. And I imagine Zechariah is just so proud in this moment and just blown away. Like I think about, I, I pray that I get to just like speak over Dean. Um, so proud and, and so full of encouragement, even prophecy. Uh, Zechariah just gets to speak this, this wonderful truth over his son. You're the prophet of the Most High. You have a huge purpose. Um, and it's to go before the, the Messiah that we've all been waiting for and, and prepare people's hearts uh, for what he's going to call them into. Uh, it's a beautiful thing. So we get the answer to that question right there. John is the return of Elijah. Uh, he's the, the Most High's prophet who goes before him. Uh, he makes way for Jesus to, to enter into the world and, and, and rescue people. And so the last thing that we'll look at is... Uh, what his work consists of. Uh, so verse 77 says, to give knowledge of salvation, this is what John's gonna do as the prophet of the Most High, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. So this is what John is proclaiming to the world. This is his ministry. This is what it consists of. He's the forerunner of the Messiah, but he's, he's doing this largely in part kind of alongside the Messiah, like a little ahead of him, but alongside him. Jesus and John's ministry was a lot of the same teaching of salvation. Uh, 
real quick, wh- what is salvation? What is John calling people uh, into a knowledge of? Uh, if we look at the word salvation and look at the Bible, we see a lot of salvation from uh, right things like plagues and sickness and sin and war and like we there's many moments across the Bible that we need salvation many moments in our life we need salvation but the ultimate biblical salvation that John starts calling people into is we need salvation from God R.C. Sproul says there's no worse catastrophe that could ever befall you than to fall into the hands of the living God while you're still in sin so sin is is definitely we need saving from sin but sin is putting a mark on us that the wrath of God is coming for so we need saving from God the the, the great and dreadful day of the Lord that's what Malachi said Elijah is going to signal that it's either going to be great or it's going to be dreadful uh, it depends on the state of your heart and uh, whether you have received the forgiveness of sins which is the next thing that Zacharias says and what John calls people into and what Jesus extends to people. So we need, we, we are not right with God in our sin. We are uh, enemies. We are uh, not reconciled with him. We're estranged. And, and John is saying, if you want to be right with the most high God, then there's something that needs to happen in your heart. And it is repentance. And uh, you need to receive the forgiveness of sin, which is offered to you. Uh, And I think that's a mind-blowing message for the people at that time. He's saying your sins can be forgiven. And it's not like through a sacrificial system that we're used to. It's going to be through the sacrifice of uh, the the Lamb of God. So John calls people into repentance through the forgiveness of sins. This is the horn of salvation coming to save us by extending us forgiveness. And it's a forgiveness nobody has experienced. It's a forgiveness that draws you into intimacy with Christ. What he's doing is making you clean so that you can be in his presence and have intimacy with him, to know him. It says to all who receive it, who believe in his name, he gives the right to become children of God. This is an intimacy that the Old Testament did not know. We're very aware of it on this side of Christ, and it's beautiful. Uh, but I don't want to lose like the awe of it. Like We get to know Jesus We get to walk with Jesus. The Spirit actually lives in us. We're not waiting for a prophet to tell us something. We have intimacy with him if our sins have been forgiven. Uh, It's pretty beautiful. It's it's the intimacy offered to us by the blood of the Lamb. And uh, so why does this salvation come? Like why, if we're not right with God, would he extend forgiveness to us? It's the next part of Zechariah's song. Because of the tender mercy of our God. He's full of mercy for his people. He loves you. He wants you. Uh, And he knows that you're not right with him. So he made a way for you to be right with him. Um, And it's because of his tender mercy, his heart. Uh, I read about a a marriage seminar uh, just for women, a women's seminar. uh, And at that marriage seminar, they, one of the sessions they had the women write down uh, like attributes they wanted in a husband uh, as they were, if they were already married, what they were looking for. Uh, or maybe still. Maybe they, they still want their husband to have some of these attributes. Or if they were single, what they were looking for in a husband. So write down attributes of a man that they, that they were looking for. And they tallied it all up. At the end of that session, they read off uh, the, the most uh, written down attributes. And the two most written down attributes in that seminar were strength. Want a strong man. And tenderness. Want a tender man. Uh, they don't want to just marry a a brute, a bull with no attachment to his emotions, and they don't want to marry a mouse uh, that can't stand up when, when he needs to stand up in strength. So that's what ladies are looking for, by the way. Dudes, uh, be those two things uh, in one. Jesus is the husband of the church, and he is strong and mighty. He's full of mercy and tenderness. Uh, he's the, the best example of that. Uh, guys, just try to look like Jesus, and it'll go a long way in your life. Uh, girls, look for guys that look like Jesus. Uh, so Jesus is, is these things, and it's, it's because of his tender mercy that uh, he extends true forgiveness to, 
to us in our sin so that we can be close to him, that we can know him. It's this intimacy that he offers to us. Uh, and Zechariah is singing about it. He's singing praise about it. He's saying, this is what's happening. This is happening right now. This is a big thing. Uh, and the final section right here of this song, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. This is just like a, as a creative heart, this is like the, the, the beautiful part of this song. I love it. The, the language, the sunrise, the light. Uh, I want to write a song about it, so we'll see. Uh, Isaiah 9, I, this is the prophecy that Zechariah is talking about right here. Isaiah 9, 2 through 3, uh, prophesied that the people who walked in darkness, past tense, prophetic, uh, they have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them the light has shone. So Zechariah is just calling out uh, another prophecy that is being fulfilled. It's guaranteed to be fulfilled right now. The people who have walked in darkness and have dwelt in deep darkness, on them the light is about to shine. Uh, he's calling out this sunrise that is happening. Is this east? The sunrise that is happening. Uh, in the birth of Jesus, he's saying, guys, look, like the darkness that we've been dwelling in, the black of night, it's starting to turn blue, and there's a little bit of color that's about to, to pop up over that horizon. This is the sunrise, the spiritual sunrise that we've been waiting for. This darkness does not last for us. There's a glimmer of light. He's seeing it in his wife's cousin's uh, womb, Jesus, about to burst forth burst forth the, the great light uh, of the world. When I was, uh, last summer when I was uh, caring for Dean in a bout of COVID, he had COVID, Becca had COVID, she was in bed, and uh, he was just miserable. He was like six months old, had, he was just sick and miserable, and one night, it was the worst night of, of the whole bout, he, he just like couldn't sleep. Uh, every 15 minutes, he would wake himself up crying because he just didn't feel good, and uh, so I was in his room all night just holding him and uh, bouncing him. And I would sit down sometimes. I would walk around. Just He would wake up crying, and I would shush him. And it was just like the longest night of my life, truly, one of them. Uh, just up all night holding him as he cries and miserable. And I just kept praying, Lord, please get me through this night. Like this is, I mean, if you've been up all night, you know. It's just such a long night. And uh, Dean just didn't feel good. And I was like, Lord, just help him feel better and give me the strength for another hour. Just one more hour, Lord, help me, help me get through another hour. Uh, and I just kept praying that over and over and over. And then finally, there was this moment where I, I was like, I, I don't know if my eyes have adjusted, but I'm like, I'm seeing things in the room a little bit better. And I looked to the window and above his curtains, there was a little bit of light. And the hope that filled me in that moment uh, is very tangible and I still remember it very well. Just the hope of light entering into a, a, a long, dark night. Uh, it was amazing. And I was super exhausted the whole day. I don't, I don't know why I was so happy that it was day because I didn't get any sleep, but there's real hope that comes with light in a, in a dark night. And, and Zechariah is, is crying out to, to the people in the room and, and to the world like, the darkness is about to be over. The light is about to, to shine in. This is the spiritual sunrise that we've been waiting for. Uh, and it's prophesied in Malachi 4, 2. But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings. And you shall go out leaping like calves from the stall. Yesterday I looked up calf leaping on YouTube. Uh, my sister and my wife were sitting there on the couch and I typed it in and they said, what are you doing? And I didn't tell them. I just, I watched the video. I just clicked on a couple videos. And there's lots of videos if you wanna go look uh, of calves leaping from stalls. Uh, and I think it's cause they've like been cooped up all winter or something. They get to stretch their legs finally. Or if you know the reason, come tell me after. But honestly, it brought me a lot of joy. And maybe it's cause I've been sitting in this for a while, but watching a couple of those videos, maybe we'll put it in a newsletter. Just like attach one of those videos, Jelana. Uh, just so we can have a visual for this, this it's, it's a beautiful thing. It's like these calves who have been 
cooped up or something, have this whole field and you open the gate and they just start dancing off into the field. They just run and jump. Uh, it's pretty awesome. And, and that's what it says about us. The sun of righteousness rises on us. The night is over. His light shines on us and we just get to leap in joy um, in our freedom now uh, because of, of what he's done. Uh, it's a beautiful thing. So uh, to close, what do we take away? This is a lot of, there's a lot in this song. I was trying to make it compact and pull out some things that just made sense. Uh, but good on your promise. That's, that's what I said at the beginning. I think what we take away from this whole song, at least one thing, is that all God's promises are yes and amen. He's good on his word. Um, and we see it so clearly in this song because uh, obviously Zechariah's like, oh, here's a covenant he's fulfilling. Oh, here's another one. Oh, he also told me I was going to have a son, and that came to pass. Like, so obviously God is keeping his word. He's good at doing that. Uh, but we see it even more clearly now uh, than Zechariah got to in that moment because uh, we've seen the, the blood of Jesus uh, spilled for us, his body broken for us. And uh, his blood is the proof that he keeps his word, and the spirit now is our assurance, blessed assurance. We sang that earlier. Jesus is mine. He purchased us. Uh, he set us in the high places. And uh, that means that we can serve without fear and holiness and righteousness all the days of our lives. That means we can, we can pour out our lives as a living sacrifice. Romans 12. I preached on that the last time I preached. I worked it into this sermon. Romans 12. We can offer ourselves as a living sacrifice to him, holy and pleasing to him, without fear. We can serve him and walk all the days of our lives uh, in this freedom and in this light that he's He's led us in, in the way of peace. And that means also that when deserts come, when doubts come, when, when valleys are long and low, and uh, we're, we're just in these seasons where it's like we're not feeling the nearness of God or hearing him speak, we can cling to his promises because he is good on his word, and we've seen it. We know it. We know that he is, uh, and we can praise his promises for you. I just want to read a few. He's not, he's not going to leave you. He's never going to forsake you. He, he will strengthen you in your moment of need. He will take care of all your needs. He promises. He's working all things for your good. He is a refuge in the battle. He is a solid rock that waves break against. He protects you. Uh, he gives you rest. He gives you peace. He's promised all these things to you. Uh, he's for you, and, and his promises are, are worth praising him for. So I, I think the takeaway for us is, Lord, you're good on your word. I believe it. Help my unbelief if there is any. But uh, whatever comes my way in this life, help me to cling to the promises that you've told me. Uh, because I know that you're a promise maker and you're a promise keeper. Uh, and that should just cause us to praise him which is what we're going to do. We're going to respond in praise. Uh, he's, worth, he's worth praising. He's worth offering our lives as a spiritual sacrifice, as an act of worship, and he's worth trusting. He's, he's good on his word. He's good on his promise. Uh, so I'm going to pray for us. The band will come up. We're, we'll respond in praise uh, to him. But for a moment, I just want to give us silence, give us just a space to pause and, and just think about promises. Uh, I'll pray here in just a minute, but I just want you to dwell on this for a second. Think about the promises God has told you and which one maybe you're not believing right now, which one you need to cling to a little harder today. Um, just take a minute to just respond uh, in your own hearts. Lord, you are good on your word. Uh, we've seen it in our lives. We've seen it in your word, uh, this story of redemption. Lord, you're good on your word, and uh, we just believe that this morning. We just say it out loud. We believe it. We believe that you 
come through uh, the way you say you're going to. And uh, we believe that uh, what you've said is what we can build our lives on, a firm foundation for us. Uh, so I just pray that we cling to that. And I just pray that if people in this room are in a desert season, that they're just needing to remember your promises, that they would remember it today. If people are in the valley this morning, uh, just needing to remember your promises, that they would just cling to it today. Uh, and I pray that deliverance would happen, uh, and that you would be near, and that you would speak again, you would pour out rain, that you would lead through valleys. Uh, but for all of us, God, I just pray that no matter what happens each day of our lives that you give us, our foundation, Lord, would be you, your word, your promises, that we would just plant firmly our feet uh, on your rock and, and just know that you're good and you're for us and you're working. And the birth of John the Baptist is evidence of that um, and the birth of Jesus that we're going to get to. Lord, it, it just gives us so much hope. Uh, you, you come through. You keep your word, God. So uh, whatever it is that we need to remember this morning, Spirit, would you just bring it right to the forefront of our minds and our hearts, and would we just cling to it? And uh, God, I pray for repentance in this room uh, where we don't believe, uh, where we doubt maybe. Um, Lord, bring repentance in your kindness to us and uh, help us to just walk out of here full of faith, assured of what we know, and uh, that we would just walk in the way of peace that Jesus is leading us in. Uh, so we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your spirit. Uh, who's in us and with us right now. And uh, we just want to give you praise. Our desire is just to honor you this morning. Uh, so we do that now. It's in your name, Jesus. Amen. We'll stand and sing.